Hi and welcome back to the second in the series of videos on decision trees. Now last time we looked at categorical data and constructing a very simple yes-no type um, decision tree. What we're going to look at this time is moving to continuous data and how you deal with that additional level of complexity. So the algorithm we used last time was the ID3 algorithm. And if you're doing ID3, then the data has to be categorical. You can only have um, questions which have a yes, no answer. Um, but the successor to ID3, known as C4.5, this allows for continuous data. Um, and for each attribute, what it essentially does is it iterates through all of the potential splits um, with each split being the midpoint between successive values. So what you do is, um, rather than just calculating the um, information gain on a category, for each variable you work out the cutoff point in that data set which maximizes the information gain for that choice. And then you're comparing all of these different um, choices across the different variables um, and you're looking at the one which gives the highest information gain from the highest information gain within those categories. Um, because what you're always trying to do here is you're trying to minimise entropy. You're trying to come up with something which gives you the, the, the greatest information gain, the greatest improvement in um, decision-making capabilities. Um, and C4.5, and we won't go into it here, but it also um, is useful in that it can deal with missing values and it also includes a process for pruning decision trees. So I won't go into that here. Um, we'll just look at the continuous approach. Um, but um, it is um, a, a more useful, and more developed approach than ID3 was. So looking at continuous data, um, which is really what we want to do if we're looking at um, credit risk modeling, um, we've uh, I've taken some credit risk data. So. I've expanded beyond what I did before, and I've taken um, default data on 590 firms, of which 566 are solvent, 24 are insolvent. I'm looking at the same variables I've looked at in all the analysis I've done in the past, EBIT over assets, log of assets over liabilities, um, retained earnings over assets, and free cash flow over assets. And I've also gone through the laborious task of constructing decision trees in Excel, which really is laborious, which is why in the um, third of these videos I'll show you how to do it in R, where it's really not laborious at all. Um, but anyway, um, to show that it can be done in Excel, I, I've done it in Excel. So the first stage is calculating initial entropy for the full data set. And this, again, forms the basis for the calculation of information gain, because information gain has to be gained from something, and the something that it is from is um, the entropy of the full data set. So we've got this data um, this, this data here, or the first few lines of the data. Um, the number in solvent is simply a count if based on um, the insolvent data, um, and a count if for solvent as well, so it says as I, as I indicated, 24 insolvent and 566 solvent. Um, the proportion of um, insolvent schemes is then calculated and solvent schemes and the entropy is calculated um, as such. So looking at those proportions um, multiplied by um, the uh, log of those proportions. So the first split, just shifting across, we're going to try on EBIT over assets. So for all 590 firms, this is what we do. We take the original data and we sort it by EBIT over assets. So you notice that that data there is going from the lowest level of EBIT over assets to the highest level of EBIT over assets. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to work out the cutoff point within that group, which gives you the best split in terms of solvent and insolvent. And we count them and we find we have um, 590, which is good because that's the data set we started with. And then this is how we deal with it. So I've got two sets of numbers that I look at, the top split and the bottom split. So the top split is going to essentially calculate the entropy for the top group, and it will move down as these cells move down. So you can see, if you look at 
P7 and Q7. I've got one insolvent and no solvent. Um, if I look at uh, P8 and Q8, I've got two insolvent and uh, none solvent. So, so the number of firms grows as I go as I go down, both insolvent and solvent. And what I'm doing is um, in each of those cells, I'm doing just a count if on the insolvent um, and the solvent cells. I then calculate the entropy um, component for the insolvent cells, the entropy component for the solvent cells and then the total entropy. Then moving across, I do something quite similar, but I just do it for the, um, for the bottom cells instead. So you can see here that the numbers actually decrease. Um, so in V7 and W7, I've got 23 and 566. V8 and W8, I've got 22 and 566, because as we move down, the, the size of the bottom is starting to shrink. So again, I've got a count if here, which is slightly more convoluted because I need to tell it to only look at where I am down to the bottom for insolvent uh, and a similar one for solvent. Then look at the proportion of the top split, the proportion of the bottom split, because these are the things which I need to um, weight these two entropy calculations by. And then what I've got here is the proportion of the top split multiplied by that entropy in the top part of the data plus the proportion in the bottom split multiplied by the entropy of the bottom set of the data and i've just got this little is air thing in here because um, if you've got um, a class where there's nothing in it and you try and calculate the entropy number you, you end up with an error term so i just say you know if you've got an error term just call it one otherwise uses actual calculation. Then um, I've got this uh, little piece of code here which just um, tells me what this range is. And the reason I did this is because I've used these formulas across the whole way to try to construct the decision tree. And I've said, give me the lowest value of um, weighted entropy here, the lowest number that I've got. And that will give me the biggest information gain, which is the initial entropy less that number. And also, I can find that by using um, this match term, which will tell me whereabouts it is. Um, and it tells me that it's 86 um, cells down. And it tells me that the threshold figure, using that offset, is 0 0.008708. So um, what I know is that if I've got um, a value of EBIT over assets below that, then the firm is more likely to be insolvent. If it's above that, it's more likely to be solvent. So that is how you calculate a, um, a decision tree node uh, uh, and uh, work out where your uh, classifier should sit um, in Excel under um, this particular algorithm. So, if I do that, what I find is the best initial classifier isn't actually EBIT over assets, it's log of assets over liabilities. Um, and what I find there is that um, if I've got a log of assets under liabilities of below 0 0.193899, I've got 21 insolvent and 111 solvent. If it's greater than that figure though, I've only got three insolvent and 455 solvent. So, that actually gives me the greatest information gain. I can then look at a second split. Under no, a further split on the EBIT over assets is, is efficient. Um, it means that I've actually got 100%. I can identify all of the um, insolvent and only insolvent ones if I use that as my second uh, classifier. And uh, the likely solvent ones are um, uh, similarly easy to is to find um, but that's as far as I can get on that one if I split on free cash flow over assets though if my answer to um, after my split on log of assets over liabilities being yes I find that that is my best split on the other side of the tree which gives me a yes of 0.63 and a no of 0.038 and the scope for more work um, in particular, if I then split on uh, retained earnings over assets, 
um, I find that I can get um, a pretty good answer for uh, yes and no um, on that. Um, on, on the no side, under free cash flow of assets, like, there's, there's nothing more I can get. And then I can further split by EBIT over assets on the no side, which again leads me to a very good answer for likely insolvent and likely solvent. Perfect, admittedly with not many um, firms being looked at. And, and the previous branch, I just need to put that down as likely insolvent at 0.875. There's nothing I can do better on that. So that, that's what happens if you're doing stuff with, with entropy. Um, and that is one, uh, one of the main measures of impurity used, but there are others. And then the most commonly used alternative is what's called Gini impurity. And this is calculated as 1 minus the sum over all x of p of x squared. So it's actually a slightly simpler um, calculation. You've just got um, p of x, sum of p of x squared rather than sum of p of x log to the base 2 of px. And this is used in something called the CART methodology, so classification and, and regression trees. And as we'll see later, it does actually give you slightly um, different results. So it is worth, it is worth uh, looking at. So ID3 and C4.5 are classification trees. CART, um, classification and regression trees, it's got a similar approach to ID3 uh, and C4.5. It uses Gini impurity rather than entropy, but it also does regression trees. So these are things which um, don't just use continuous data, but they also try to predict values, which in certain scenarios can be useful. But if we're looking at credit risk, what we're, what we're trying to do really is classify rather than come up with numbers. It's slightly less useful, so it's not something I'm going to look at uh, in more detail here. So that is uh, that's it for this video, where we're looking at, or we've looked at, um, slightly more involved decision trees, ones using continuous variables, and um, a slightly more involved algorithm. Um, what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to move on to how to do this in R, plus a little bit on how to better use the data as well. And we'll see how much easier it is in R. Um, and also how you can do some things like pruning as well, which, uh, which we haven't really covered yet. So um, hopefully you will join me for that when I uh, post that next video.